Five, four, three, two, one. Pop short. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the One Punch Short Podcast. Uh, apologies in advance, I'm still uh, battling a bit of a cold here, or flu-like symptoms, as they like to call it in the NHL. Uh, so apologies for that, if I'm a bit snuffly and, and croaky and so forth. Uh, Patrick Smith from A View from the Bridge, the official podcast of the Belfast Giants will be joining me later in the show to talk about the Friendship 4 tournament that took place in Belfast this past weekend. We'll also be talking a little bit about the start to the Elite League season. A couple of NHL news and notes before that, however. Carey Price has been ruled out for at least six weeks, which is, to be fair, a blow for the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, Zach Fucali was called up, which is a little bit of a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. Many thought Dustin Dustin Tokarski tripping over my words, would back up Mike Condon and they would run with Condon and Tukarski as the pair until Price returned. But it's Vukali who gets the nod, uh, one of the top prospect goaltenders in the league. He was inside the top 10 in Ingold Magazine's top 50 goaltending prospects for 2015-16. Certainly a divisive figure. Some people don't feel he should rank that highly. Others are adamant that he is one of the better goaltending prospects. But this is a good chance for Vukali and for Condon, who made a strong start to his NHL career when Price was on the shelf a few weeks ago. Whether he can continue that or build on that remains to be seen. He did have a few wobbles towards the end of his last stint as the team's starter. Um, now, Price re-aggravated what we believe to be a knee injury. Looks like he's going to miss the Winter Classic, which is obviously a great shame. But the important thing is for the Canadians is getting Price healthy again. I mean, they're 11 points clear at the top of the Atlantic Division. They're 9-2-1 and on the road. They're 10-2-2 two two at home. Uh, they've scored 90 goals already. They've only conceded 57, which is one of the better tallies in the league. Sure, that goal differential of 33 is probably going to come down a bit without Price. But this is still a team playing extremely well. I watched the game against the Rangers last Wednesday and I tuned in late. I caught the, the last five minutes of the second period, which was pretty much all Rangers from what I saw. And the third period was just complete domination by the Habs. It was extremely impressive watching them take when their Eastern Conference rivals apart like that. It also showed some holes in the Rangers game, which I think we saw again in the following two games when they were beaten by Boston and then by Philadelphia. I think they struggled again with the, the faster forwards. Uh, and that's a problem for the Rangers, one that isn't new, and they're still playing pretty well. Henrik Lundqvist has been excellent. And as we've said on the podcast before, a lot of people don't feel the Rangers have hit the highest gear just yet. So room for improvement there. Uh, Jonathan Bernier was sent down to the Toronto Marlies in the AH held today for a conditioning assignment he'll be there for about 10 days and this seems like a positive move for Bernier even though there are two Mali's home games which means the media interest is probably going to be high you've got to feel like this is a chance for him to just go back to basics try and rediscover his form because he slipped down the depth chart this year James Ryan has been excellent Garrett Sparks got a shut out on debut so that was a new Toronto Maple Leafs record so you know things are tough for Bernier he signed through to 2017 I think a lot of people still believe there is a good goaltender in there, but he's been clearly off base so far this season. His skating's not been quite right. His movement's been a little bit excessive at times. He doesn't look as composed as he did last year or, or the year before when he had such an excellent start to his Maple Leafs career. So pressure on Bernier there. I think he'll bounce back, but if he does, then the Leafs have a decision to make because Reimer is a UFA in the summer and they're not going to want to use a guy who is playing so well for nothing. A couple of notes on the Art Ross race before Patrick joins us. Uh, Evgeny Malkin's been excellent lately for the Pittsburgh Quangins. I know a lot of the attention is on Sidney Crosby and his scoring roles, but Malkin has been truly exceptional. His spinorama goal against the Edmonton Oilers the other night was a thing of beauty. He's been brilliant. He's moved up to 25 points now, uh, really carrying the load for the Penguins, who's often struggled out of the gate, really. Uh, the other team with... Well, offensive power to burn, apparently, at the moment, is the Dallas Stars. Though, you may say it's limited to three guys. Jamie Benn, Tyler Sagan, and John Klingberg have just lit the league up this year. Jamie Benn is second in point scoring. He's 35 to Patrick Kane's 38. Benn also has a league-leading 18 goals. Tyler Sagan has 34 points. And Klingberg is ranked fifth in scoring right now with 27 points. He's ahead of Evgeny Kuznetsov and Eric Carlson, who have 26. Max Pacioretty and Taylor Hall also have 25, along with Malkin. So, yeah, a pretty impressive 
and goings on in Texas right now. Whether they can keep this pace up remains to be seen. I think the projection at the current rate would put them for something like 350 points combined between the three of them, which is just an insane amount. So exciting times in Dallas, and it's going to be interesting to see how long and how well they maintain that kind of offensive weight between those three. Joining me on this week's One Puck Short podcast, the host of A View from the Bridge, the official podcast of the Belfast Giants, the one and only Mr. Patrick Smith. Hi, Paddy. How are you? How are you, Rob? Good to hear from you. Yeah, and you. Pleasure to have you back on again, as always. I know you uh, do your bit to pump the show's tyres, and for that I am eternally grateful. Ah, uh, long-time listener, mate. You know me. I love the show. <laughs> uh, so this weekend you were in Belfast for the Friendship 4 tournament. People who tuned into last week's show will have heard me talk to Dave Starman, the NCAA analyst, about the tournament. Uh, UMass Lau came out as victors, but all round, I think, a pretty successful tournament for both the NCAA and hockey in Belfast. First of all, I'm I'm, I'm quite honoured that you have me on after such an esteemed guest last week, <laughs> a man who's far more qualified to talk about this level of hockey than I am. Um, however, yes, uh, what a weekend it was, uh, I say, both for the hockey and for the organisation with regards to the Belfast Giants. Uh, going in there, I, I hold my hands up, so I've done a bit of research into it, I watched a little bit of the NCAA, I, 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 I'm not a big... I'm not I'm not well knowledge or not well versed in it and on the style, but I've come out of the SSE arena a massive fan of the style of hockey, of the speed of the hockey, of the hunger in these kids. And 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 UMass Lowell, who had to come from behind twice over the weekend, both in the semi final against Northeastern, who were the better side for fifty five minutes of that game. But uh UMass kept with them and then forced the overtime and then and, and uh, Zinc wins it in overtime for them. And then into the final, once again, Brown, highly unfavoured, mm. took them all the way to penalty shots. And I don't think that anybody in that arena, not least Steve Thornton, Shane Johnson, Brandon Benedict, who are all right in the middle of organising this, I don't think they could have scripted a weekend that went as well as, as the Friendship Four did this weekend in Belfast. Mm, no, certainly, as you say, for for Lau to come from behind in the semi final because mm-hmm. that was a narrative of itself. They were quite heavy favourites coming into the tournament. I think the lowest I've seen them ranked recently is seventh. Obviously, mm-hmm. a variety of different rankings. Some are personal, some are aggregated by various means. And I think the lowest, as I said, was seventh uh, mm-hmm. out of all the, the universities in the NCAA. So they were heavy favourites coming in. So. Granted, the the favourites came out of it with the Bell Park Trophy, but the the narrative was there. They come from behind, win, then the penalty shots, and, and Brown obviously pushing them so close. It's a, a great advert for college hockey. I think, I mean, like you, I'm reasonably new to it. I came to it. I'd watched the Frozen Four before as more of a neutral, but uh, a colleague in our US office there in East Lansing, where the Michigan State Spartans are based, mm-hmm. he's dragged me in a little bit more. And certainly, to have an event like that here in the UK is a massive credit to Belfast. Mm, I think that one of the things that uh, Coach Basin of the of the of the New Mass Lowell said in his uh, post game press conference after the final was that the actual hoopla and everything that went on around this tournament was as close to the frozen four as he's ever experienced. Um, that's a great compliment to what was what was achieved Definitely. in Belfast and and the fact that you talk to some of these guys. I talked to Tim Ernst very briefly um, midway through, or before the final, about midway through Saturday, and asked him, you know, how he's preparing and stuff like that. And he, he, he admitted he was quite nervous and that, you know, he was looking forward to the game and he'd never been able, he'd never been overseas. He'd never be able to, to, to ex- experience this sort of thing before. And he went into that final to him like it was the Stanley Cup game seven. And you could see how pumped up these guys were going out onto the ice. And, and it showed. And for a team, like, let's say, as you said, UMass were highly favoured coming into it. But when Brown started to, to keep with them and then go ahead, people are starting to think we're about to get a, a great story here. Brown, with with just about a minute left on the clock, Brown are, have their one hand on that bell, on that bell pot, the the, the bell from uh, Templemore uh, Primary School that was that was that was to be the trophy. They had one hand on it and. And the puck, you know, bounces in front, and uh, and uh, it's 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 CJ Smith who who finds the way to, to put it in the back of the net and force it in the overtime. I, the, the atmosphere within the SSE was something that I haven't experienced since the Sheffield Steelers came in to try to stop us from winning the league a couple of years ago. Everybody was engaged, and it was incredible considering that 
very few people, and I say very few. I, I think they estimate around six hundred people travelled from the states, mm. which is pretty good considering. It's a good effort, yeah. yeah Especially I, so close to Thanksgiving as well. Absolutely, and and but so you take into account there's about three four thousand in there who are not in any way tied to the game, not in any way tied to these teams, but the atmosphere was electric. And when you have a game a uh, final as it was then, yeah, there's it's quite obvious as to why. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, the, the trophy itself was formed from a bell from a local school. I saw on Twitter several of the teams went out into the community as well to engage mm-hmm. with, with the people in and around Belfast. Yeah, it was, there was such a tie-in with Belfast City Council in this that made, made it happen. I know Lord Mayor Arthur Carson spoke just over the weekend about the tie-in in regards to science, technology, engineering and mathematics, the STEM program that was going on. And, and it being NCAA and, and these being college teams, they did. They went out into the community. They went to these different schools. They got involved in these different schools, and it was quite funny. On the Saturday, on the fr- Saturday and Friday afternoon, most of the tickets were bought by sponsors for these schools. So you had massive school groups getting so engaged in the game, holding up banners that read things like "Brown will frown when Colgate come to town," and you know they were they were so <laughs> there were so many banners, so many things, and, and so many just shouting for the teams that came to visit their school um davy said on our show this week that his little nephew was so well engaged in it that when when i think it was umass came to his school that he his nephew ran up to davy saying look you know, it was a bit of paper ripped out of his notebook where a couple of umass guys had signed it and he thought this was the greatest thing ever and it should yeah. that these big american guys were coming in and you know hid to his school and, and signing off things like that and you can see the excitement that it brought to these kids and that was a big aspect of it the the links with the schools, the links with STAM, the STEM, and and the, and the tie-in with the Belfast City Council, and that's why midway through the uh, the first intermission in the final, uh, it was announced that we're going to have it all again next year. Which, with the tie-in with both cities, Boston and Belfast, is is great both for Ooh, definitely, it's bo- yeah. bo- bo- not just for the links between these two cities, but. I was saying this to David. You know, I'm a, as you know, I'm a massive Belfast Giants fan. Following 15 years and 15 years ago, when the Giants were first coming to the floor, you know, it was a novelty. I, I'm, I'm mildly ridiculed. This is not a sport that is anyway endemic with with Northern Ireland, with Belfast and and f- Great Britain in general. Um, yeah, exactly. And few saw it sticking in Belfast at all. You know, few saw it getting any more than a couple of years. And 15 years down the line, we've had the Boston Bruins, and now we've got had an NCAA tournament and we're having another one coming up. Um, we're getting descriptions that it's like a Frozen Four. It sure it sort of validates hockey within Northern Ireland, validates hockey within Belfast. And, you know, it, it, a, lot of, a lot of our fans left are both excited and actually quite proud. Hmm. Uh, and as you said, it's going to come back next year. And I know that it was one of the things that, that Dave Starman and I spoke about last week was whether the NCAA would look to do other tournaments or similar in Europe, because some some teams do have kind of scouting expeditions yes. in, into Scandinavia specifically. So for the, the friendship for to be coming back next year, that, that's big news. I, I've already basically put in my pass. <laughs> it's like. It's going to be roughly this time next year. Is, yes. I'd kind of like to go. So I got the thumbs up, so I'm happy. Happy now. days. Uh, but to have that become a regular event, as you said, it, it not only helps to validate hockey in Northern Ireland, but I think it does in, in the British Isles in general mm. because, uh, to be fair, this is the inaugural year. So you can they, there's going to be one or two bits where not only the, the guys running it, as you said, Brandon Bentick, Steve Thornton and, and co. running it are going to learn from the experience. Mm. But it's going to be something that will grow within the hockey community, I think. And, you and I have opined about it before, how a lot of the stories about British hockey are very occasionally like Chris Higgins' behind-the-back pass or Ben O'Connor's penalty shot, but quite often there, the darker side of the sport, mm-hmm. Joe Grimaldi's helmet throw, and, and there's some things that you don't really want to be known for, you know, the, the One Direction saga, things like that that you don't really want your sport to be known for. You want it to be known for the skill level. Yes. And I hope that this, even though it's an NCAA tournament, being here kind of makes people look at just British hockey in general a bit different that hey you know people are coming out to support this event they're really getting behind it uh, and you know it's worth these teams coming back because it's been such a success uh, and one of the things I've often kind of been uh, a little bit not 
beleaguered by. But I've not never understood why more British teams don't seem to more actively try and recruit from the NCAA. I know this is something that, that David McGimsey touched on this week mm-hmm. in, in The View from the Bridge, about like the Elite League recruiting for the NCAA, but also the, the EPL, because the Phantoms got Brent Goff straight from Merrimack College a few years ago, and he wasn't a prolific scorer for Merrimack, mm. but he's got 100 points for the Phantoms in at least two of his three years, and he was close to 100 points in the other season. It seems like a pretty good place for teams to go, because it gives these young guys a chance to experience... Europe, and and you know, granted, the top guys are probably going to go to the NHL or maybe the top European leagues. There's some really talented guys that would jump at the chance, I think, to come and play. Here. Yeah, I think one of the things again, harkening back to that press conference with um, with Coach Basin, was he was asked about you know the city, about this, about the tournament, and about the Belfast Giants themselves. And his line was, "This is possibly one of the best." Uh, recruitment tools that the Belfast Giants could possibly have, bringing these kids, sure, yeah. bringing these kids over to Belfast, showing them the facilities that they have, showing them the hospitality that is shown, that, that 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 we have in Belfast. That okay, not all these kids are going to go and uh, and make the show. Some of them may go AHL, some of yeah. them may not even make that. Some of them may take a four end to Europe, and even if they don't come to Belfast, there might be friends of theirs who play the game who might say, "Actually, I'm, I'm thinking about playing in the UK." You know, and they'll say, well, actually, we were in Belfast that weekend and it was absolutely superb. You'd go along, go and talk to this guy, go talk to that guy. Now, yeah, you're right. We brought up the fact that you're recruiting directly from the NCAA. It all depends on the levels. A lot of the guys are quite young. But, but then when I look back to the ISL days, Shane Johnson joined the um, London Knights about one year removed from the NCAA. He'd just come out of BU. I think he'd played a, about a half a season for Team Canada as they went through their little European tour. And then he was in the London Knights in the ISL. You know, we've had players like um, Chris Higgins, who wasn't that long out of BU also. And... And we've had young players who come out of the juniors and probably only the first and second year pro. So why couldn't we recruit directly out of the NCAA? One of the jokes that was me, I say jokes. <laughs> we brought up Chris Forney, obviously brother of uh, of Mike Forney, yeah. who was playing for UMass. And, uh, you know, he scored a great goal in that final. And uh, we said to him, you know, we'd like to see him here in Belfast and and. Uh, and Coach Basin said, uh, you, "You can wait three years." Um, <laughs> but we saw so many. So, so just uh, we saw so much high quality ta- talent, like Nick Lappin. Uh, the one that really stood out was the player of the tournament was it was tar- Tommy Martian, who they're already talking about. You know that he probably won't even finish the NCAA. He'll be he'll be up the leagues. He'll be poached and yeah. gone pretty quickly. And you can see why the guy's ability on the puck is his actual vision, and not just that, but his ability to actually. Get himself free, put himself on the edge of the crease, and then take the tip pass and 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 find the back of the net. The guy was unreal, and I put him right up there as well. Like some of the guys that were at Brown, um, ah, oh, sorry, sorry, Tommy Marshall was at Brown. There's some of the guys that were at um, UMass. I've already mentioned um, uh, Chris Forney, but the likes of C.J. Smith, who who scored the equaliser for UMass. The patience in him to actually, you know, the the, the wait for the netminder to go down, the goalie to go down before he put it in the back of the net. And likewise, my player of the tournament, I know Martian was brilliant, my player of the tournament was Dylan Zink, who, who on defence, first of all, scored an outstanding slap shot, an outstanding one-time strike that nearly ripped the back of the net off. <laughs> it was so, like, I, I was stood next to the... Uh, I stood next to the CEO of the Odyssey Trust, one of the guys key in this whole idea in Robert Fitzpatrick, and he was sat on a stool, and he near fell off it. Honestly, he was near on the <laughs> floor, the, 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 how this kid struck the puck. And then it was down to Dylan Zink, and it was his penalty shot. And I don't know if you've seen this penalty shot, Rob, but he sort of comes in from the right-hand side, feathers and fakes and feathers and fakes, drags it out wide to the left, and just waits. Wits. Oh yeah, he was cool, cool as you like. Just wits, and 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 the goalie goes down. It was a uh, uh, Tim Ernst. Uh, he goes down and poof, back in the net, and that's the end of it. And uh, and ah, uh, mate, uh, the buzz I got from the weekend, and the buzz from the watching how much hunger and how the speed of these guys, and and, and a big thing to the referee as well. The ref, the standard of referee, and both four men from uh, from Hockey East and four men from from ECAC, and. Um, these guys are, as Davey said on our podcast, these guys are part time, but yeah. but they let things go. They let the game flow. There were there were hits going in that in the elite league would be under Dobson probably get a five game ban. Play on, 
play on. <laughs> These kids can handle it. That's what this game's about. Play on. Yeah. If they if they can't take hits like that, then they won't make the NHL, and that's a fact. Mm. I mean, the age thing is something that that Dave Stone and I touched on last week mm-hmm. because the Big Ten are trying to change the rules slightly for older players because there, there is quite a big age range between the younger guys and, and the older students, but. I mean, you look back at Omar Pasha, mm-hmm. player coach of the Manchester Storm. Yep. He left Castleton State College. He was 23. Yep. So they're not that young in those terms. You almost feel like if, if you've got someone like Pasha, but just as an example, at 23, coming on 24, who's just left college, I mean, they surely are the bread and butter for an elite league or Premier League side because it's, hey, guys, look, you've just finished college. You're still young and carefree enough to come and play in Europe for a couple of years. Mm. Come over here, play a bit of pro hockey, live the life for a couple of years, and then you can either settle here, as some guys have done. You look at like Dwayne Newman and Doug McEwen settled here for quite a long time and others. Or they can say, you know what, I've had my couple of years. I'm now 26, 27. I need to start thinking seriously. I'm going to go back home. But somebody's had two good years mm-hmm. out of that guy. Well, I think key to that as well, especially in the UK game, is these link, are these links with universities. The fact that mm-hmm. the Belfast Giants have links with, with Ulster University and four or five guys are, are able to come in and, and do their thing there. And, uh, and you know, we probably would get players that, we couldn't afford. Let's be fair, but yeah. guys, guys who are happy to come in and do their masters, follow up on their on the degrees that they've got and do their masters as a view to what would happen outside of hockey. And maybe key to that NCAA thing is going in and saying, "Listen, you've just finished. You just finished university. You can turn pro, but stay in university and and yeah. do that next stage. Stay, have that uni life for another couple of years while also playing pro in Europe, and then go on. And why not go up to the these guys, when they come out of UMass or Brown or Northeastern mm. or Colgate and say, listen, do you remember Belfast? Remember you come up and played there? Right, we, we've got wind that maybe you might have any, <laughs> we got wind you might have any CHL spot, but we've got wind that you're probably not going to get AHL. Yeah. Why not come and play for us for two years and then try to get yeah. AHL? Because by that point, you're not going to be that much older. You'll still have a shot at it and you'll have, a, you'll have your masters behind you as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, that's what I mean. That's kind of why I've never been sure why more clubs don't sound out these guys because although they might be, you know, second line or maybe third, even depth players, the the guys above them in the roster tend to be that higher level, yeah. the AHL or, or the Jack Eichels of the world occasionally, mm-hmm. who are. I mean, Noah Hannafin went straight into the NHL with Carolina this year as well. Mm-hmm. You know, they tend to be genuinely very very good mm. hockey players at the top level mm. but you know we're we're not the, i don't mean to be disrespectful to british hockey we ain't in the top level Far so there's a lot of good guys around i mean you know as i said omar pasha he, he didn't play ncaa division one yeah he played what they call division three and he's still a pretty good player for elite league level mm. you know he's a very so it was a strange one but i had a question come in from stephen murray at mr tunes on twitter who asked uh, i guess this one for, specifically for you paddy how did the games flow at the Friendship Four more than the EIHL, and what could the EIHL do differently to improve the flow of their games? Ah, uh, Stephen, I, I bumped into Stephen actually during the uh, during the tournament. Met, met him for the first time. Very nice bloke. He, um, yeah, they flowed. As I said, the referee and the, the games flowed. The games were allowed to play. The fact that there was, yeah, you, you saw little slashes off the play. You saw little trips off the play. You saw, but nothing that was actually, you know. If you there's there's tripping and there's tripping, you know this, Rob. I mean, if, if there if yeah. there's if there's a trip call that actually you gain an advantage from, then call it. If there's a Ooh. tripping call but there's no advantage gained from it, play on. And Ooh. and that's what you saw. You saw little trips off the base, saw little slashes, saw little hits. But because there was no advantage gained from actually doing it, the referees were just keeping their hands in their pockets and letting the game play. And the game flowed because of it, and it got more and more exciting. And when the goals started flowing, and yes, there were a few incidents that were quite unsavory. There was, I think, it was in the um, in the third, fourth place game. Maybe it, there was a there was a hit in the corner where the guy was down for quite a while and had to be had to be taken off. In fairness. The guy that put the hit in was uh, was ejected from the game after a video review. Now that's another aspect of it. You know, the, the <laughs> that's yeah. another that's another can of worms that we get open. There was a video review. It wasn't used all that often. A couple of goals when on one or two other incidents, but that guy was sent to the showers after that hit. That was the only one of the whole weekend that I can think actually that was quite unsavory because the rest of it was just exciting. There was, yeah. there was I I can't. 
actually remember thinking to myself, well, this is a bit boring because I was engaged for, you know, six periods a day two uh, over the two days uh, and a couple of overtimes to boot. Um, and all down to, like I say, the fact that it was allowed to flow and the fact that you got these kids who were hungry. Hungry. Yeah. You, you've got a couple of guys who are already drafted. You've got a couple of guys who are already, you know, thinking about where they're going to go from here and the opportunity to play abroad. The, the opportunity to have this because this this will be in a goldfish bowl for them. This whole tournament is a, is a is a an unusual goldfish bowl outside of something like, yeah, absolutely. So out of something, outside of something like the bean pot and various other tournaments, the uh, frozen four. This is not something that they're used to. So you saw a lot of them making a, making the absolute most of it, and you saw the hunger and you saw the speed, and everybody who was sat in the SSC arena that weekend benefited for it. One Puck Short is brought to you in association with Eastside Hockey Manager, an in-depth ice hockey management simulation brought to you by Sports Interactive and Sega, developers of the world-famous Football Manager series, coming soon for PC via Steam. Oh, we've mentioned the Elite League now, so uh, I did want to talk to you about uh, just, just things in general, really, because I, I try and cover a few of the little bits, so not just the NHL on the, on the podcast. Obviously, we've had a bit of NCAA over the last couple of weeks because of the Friendship 4 tournaments. But as I've got you here, and as you said, uh, you're a big Giants fan, host of the official podcast, the Belfast Giants. So it seemed like a good time to catch up on what's been going on in the Elite League. And, you know, I'm neutral in this. There's teams I like to see do well for whatever reason. I like to see the Giants do well because Craig Peacock's from Peterborough as well. Same for the Panthers with David Clark. I'm always happy to see Edinburgh do well just because I really want that team to do well just <laughs> once. Uh, but yeah. this year, it kind of strikes me as the first team to figure out how to play defence will probably win. <laughs> well, that's, that's Nottingham have done for. the best so far. Yeah. The Whitman's been great in net for them. And they happen to be leading the league as a result. Yeah. I think, like you say, that that's the Bel- If that's the case, that's the Belfast Giants done for. <laughs> um, yeah, you. I think you only have to look at some of the score lines that have gone through just this week alone. You look up at Edinburgh and the the, the Tony Hand Ooh. retirement game, and it was Dundee Could have 11. That any better for a yeah. Tony Hand game? <laughs> I said Dundee eleven uh, and the Edinburgh Capitals nine in in tribute to Tony Hand. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 20 goals. We ourselves had that game in Coventry where there was almost 20 goals. And yeah, there's no team is actually, if, if one team gets on a bit of a run of form, and I'm talking about not even like, not even like five or six games, three or four games at this moment in time. Nobody's, nobody's really picking up that mantle of thinking, right, we're going to settle ourselves and we're going to be consistent. And we're going to, I say, be boring. There's a lot of offense going on here and that's not boring. That's great. Like if you want to see goals, you're going to see goals in the Elite League. But that also means that a lot of the defences are playing quite high and yeah. they're being caught, especially at the Giants. We play such a high line in defence. There's nobody really... I feel sorry for Stephen Murphy at times because <laughs> we, a, lot of our, a lot of our fans maybe jump on the bandwagon at times to say, you know, oh, Murph should have had that one. You know, when, when, he, when he's been left... With when I, when the Ford's been left all alone on Murphy and he's digged him out of his pants, yeah, you know, and, and there's nothing you can do about that. Or Murphy's been left with like a screen of about five guys in front of him. The pass has gone to a, a guy wide open on the left who's got the, a gaping net to shoot at. Yes. And you know, a Mur- Murphy's come in for a lot of stick, and from my point of view, it was quite unwarranted. Um, but Mika Wickman, we'll yeah. see it. in Belfast. We'll see it this weekend. The guy has had to step into some pretty big skits in Craig Kowalski. Mm. And in doing so, he's, he leads the league in all categories with regards to the goalkeeping. I'm sure, I don't know if you've seen him yet, you, you're, you're, better, you're better versed for speaking about goalkeepers than I am. But uh, by all accounts, he's, uh, he's more than capable of filling those Kowalski skits. I mean, from what I've seen of, of Wickman, he, he's looked good. I mean, I've never had a problem with the way Stephen Murphy plays. I think one of the things with, with Murphy is he was always kind of passive. He, he'd always stay relatively close to his crease and a, a couple of years ago when, when you and I met at uh, the Sheffield Arena it was an interesting battle for me watching Murphy with this slightly passive style and Frank Doyle who was always quite aggressive at coming out of the crease mm. uh, I love those two contrasting styles but I mean Whitman looks you know everything is advertised really yeah you know he I, looks com- composed by the I mean I don't think uh, Chris Holtz looked that bad per se and that game with Sheffield was in 9-8 in the end and Watching the highlights, the first 
four or five goals, that's harsh to pin those on Holt because some of the defensive errors were just woeful. Yeah. There um, wasn't a defence in that game. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, and I mean, Marek Pinch, I just, I, <laughs> I don't know what Sheffield's, I guess it's easier to keep him around because, you know, kind of know what you've got now while Plant recovers. But Well, I think Marek Pinch is, uh, you know, with all due respect to him, but I think it's a prime example as to what a lot of coaches have been saying mm. over the first couple of months of the season, that the well is pretty much dry. Um, you know, you, you've seen that you know, with, with the injury to Tyler Plant, mm. the, the Sheffield Steelers had to go into the market. And, and, Let's be fair. Tom was no slouch. He's, he he has the contacts. He has the yeah. connections. He knows where to go. So to pull Mark Pinch out of there and him playing as he is goes to show that maybe there is a point here. Maybe the well is dry. So then these rumors start to circulate about Brian Stewart. Now, is, uh, yeah. and then you've got the connection with Tomo to the Coventry Blaze. Mm. So does and then would would. Chuck Weber be able to go to his contacts and pull in a better netminder if Brian Stewart was to jump from the tenth position team to the third position team in the Sheffield Steelers, and what effect would that have on the Coventry Blazers' uh, confidence? I that, mean, because he's probably their well, without doubt, he's their best player. Yeah, for sure. I, the part of the the thing that interests me about this is when Tom has gone into the market. What's been his pitch? Has it been we need a guy to cover while Tyler Plant is out? Mm. Or do we need a guy who can come in and then we'll release Tyler Plant, as harsh as that might be on Tyler Plant? Because that's the thing. If they're going in saying we need cover, Mm -hmm. there's probably going to be a lot less interest where guys go, well, they might only need me for six to eight weeks. And, you know, do I really want to move to England for six to eight weeks? Some guys are going to be more open to that idea than others. Whereas if he's gone in and said, you know, we're happy to pull someone in for the rest of the season maybe they have more luck. I, I, again, obviously, I don't know what approach Tomo's taken here. Um, well, you look at that, you compare that to the Belfast Giants last year and the injury to Stephen Murphy that was, let's say, a grey area as to yeah. how long he would actually be out. Uh, Steve Thornton goes into the market, pulls in Carson Chewback, and all due respect to Carson Chewback, he's actually not doing too badly at the Edinburgh Capitals. He, he's no Stephen Murphy. You know, it, the whole joke was, you know, if you shoot high glove, on Carson Chewback, you're probably going to score nine <laughs> times out of ten, um, and you know. But that goes to show what what, what sort of what, what was Carson Chewback doing that at that point in the season, and we're talking about November time. At that point of the season, he's looking for a club, and the t- chance of a temporary position or what was to be a temporary position in the UK was was beneficial to him, or it was better than nothing. Almost was better than nothing. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, you 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 pull these things together. Is is the well dry, and how many people are willing to come and play mm. at elite league level? Now, don't get me wrong; it, it is quite disparaging, and and to say this about the elite league and the way that we're talking about it, the elite league has got better this year. Oh, hundred yeah. percent! It, it is so much improved from the, the from the from when the the, the Coventry Blaze lifted the, the the playoff trophy. I think the Coventry Blaze themselves are starting to see that. Mm. I mean, Chuck Weber ha- had an interview the other week where he's described it as having improved seventy five percent. How yeah. he quanti- how he quantifies that, I have no idea. But <laughs> but he said you know, analytics and, and, exactly. <laughs> and um, but so you. Know, we have an improved league. We have an improved standard, but that that sort of reputation doesn't instantly go everywhere. People don't just go, "Oh, UK's got better." That's yeah. got to get out. That's got to stay at this level. It's got to stay, up, but it's also got to stay at this level while also starting to develop even more in any way it can. And I know I'm opening a can of worms that may end up with this, but the whole idea of import levels going up doesn't really sit well with me. No. Um, and I'm no, I know it doesn't sit well with you, but. So you need to find a way of developing the standard without actually degrading the the, the means to bring British players through. Yeah, I, I mean that topic could be an entire episode and more of, of either of our podcasts on it's its been own. Many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and obviously, I've been on the view from the British before, and we've talked about it with Davy and, and Neil Russell. And Neil was still with you. Uh, obviously, he's moved on to to bigger bigger things now with the Manchester Storm. No, but... no, no, no. We've moved on to bigger. <laughs> um, he's moved on to the Manchester. <laughs> but one of the things that the colours kind of struck me this year is, despite. Coventry's rocky start to the year and it has been rocky let's be honest I don't think anyone predicted them to start as they have started I think the parity in the league says a lot as well because obviously Coventry have picked up some big scalps along the way despite being 10th 
in the table. And you kind of feel like there is potential there if they could just find it on a regular basis and find some consistency. But like you said, if they got on a three or four game winning streak, well, they've suddenly probably moved themselves potentially above five into eighth, so they're yeah. a playoff team again. And as yeah. they showed last year, if you can get in, anything is possible. Well, they're, they're only three games. They've only got, sorry, they've got three games less played than Fife. Yeah. They've got six games less played than the Manchester mm. Storm, and they're only three points behind. They play the Manchester Storm on Sunday. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, there's a bit of a, an attempt for a bit of a swing if they can get the victory there. But I think it's the same with any team here. You look at the Dundee Stars sitting in fourth. Oh, yeah. On the, the Stars, the Steelers and the Giants are all on 23 points. And only the Giants have played one game fewer than the other two. Mm. So you start to get that. And I think that's what brings this weekend into focus with regards to the Belfast Giants and the two games we have against the Nottingham Panthers. Lose those two games and the Nottingham Panthers jump from being five points ahead of us to being nine points ahead of us. Yeah. Win those two games and we're one point behind the Nottingham Panthers. You know, and that's how close this league is. Parity, I listened to Seth Bennett on the official Elite League podcast a few weeks ago where he had said, you know, the fans love parity. And he, sorry, he said, it's a myth that the fans love parity. You know, you want to see your team dominate. And that's actually true. I do, I did agree with him. I think for, Entertainment wise, as regards to the league competition, parity is a good thing. Seeing the Dundee Stars in fourth and climbing the, table, climbing the table, seeing the Cardiff Devils doing so well after so many years of you know just trying to fight and be there, parity is a good thing. Would I like to see my Belfast Giants dominate the league? Of course, I would. I wouldn't care about parity as, as, <laughs> as much as the next person to me. But but regards to entertainment league wide then you see it more. You see the Edinburgh Capitals being able to take... They're a much-changed side this year yeah. under Riley Emerson. Being able to take the scalp of the of the Nottingham, of the Nottingham Panthers, of the Sheffield Steelers, to be able to take the scalp of the of the Brayhead clan. You know, uh, even we had our battles in there. And then Dundee, well, a fair play to Mark Lefebvre. Absolutely. Yeah. After what happened at Coventry yeah. last year, he recruited a side that Weber took to a championship. He's come back to the Elite League and he's taken the Dundee Stars and they're beating all around him and they're mm. sitting in fourth. And that's not an unfair position for them because they are playing that well. Yeah, as you said, I mean, it's right that the sentiment that Seth brought up is right. Ultimately, everybody wants to see their team win. And maybe that's the, the, I say the advantage I have in this conversation is I don't really have a horse in the race. Yeah. I have a few interested parties where I like to see Belfast do well because, as like I said, because I know Craig Peacock and obviously you guys. And mm -hmm. same with Nottingham, I don't begrudge Clarkie any success because he's always been, a, been great whenever I've dealt with him, either in a, a media, inverted common sense, or from a hockey sense. He's taught me a lot mm -hmm. as well. And, and, you know, Cardiff, having known Ben Bounds for so many years and things like that. So I don't have a set horse. So it's great to see mm -hmm. all these different people in the mix. And, and as I said, you know, it's. It's great to see Manchester taking some, some scalps in their first season because that will come about quite quickly. Uh, and but no, 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 come on now, Rob. <laughs> it's, it's only been a couple of days and I'm still stinging. We're going to have to see Neil <laughs> but, Russell on Sunday. Oh, sure. I, I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't moonwalk past you on purpose. To be yeah. <laughs> but it's those kind of results that make the white Again, this comes back to what we said earlier in the show. Is If you've got a competitive league, granted, I think... If you ask people at the start of each season who they thought would win, it's going to come down to a small handful of sides. Mm -hmm. Belfast, Sheffield, Nottingham, Cardiff are in that mix again. and pr You'd probably say Brayhead as well. They've not had a brilliant start of the year, but most people would say those four or five are in the mix to win the league. Well, that's half the league. That's not bad going for, for a 10-team league to have five teams or four teams actively competing. And then the others capable of competing for maybe a cup or in the playoffs or being spoilers in the league title being yeah, actually exactly. have, actually having that input now the only thing i will say and and it'll play out probably over the christmas period and we'll, it'll probably come more into focus come january is the fact that the brayhead clan only have five cross conference games left to play and the remainder of their games will be in within the gardener conference yeah now that's when we start to see whether can have you know has the Gardner Conference increased so much with regards to Edinburgh and Dundee and Fife 
Um, with all due respect to the Storm, I don't think they're going to compete. They're going to fight for that eighth spot. I have no yeah. doubt about that. I don't think with with passion uh, uh, and televisions, Neil, the coach Russell there, <laughs> there's no way that they won't have the passion and the drive to try to get into that eight. And that and that's and without doubt, that's their aim. But in their first season, that was yeah. always going to be their realistic. Yeah. Like, can we grab seventh or eighth? This is Absolutely. The first year, let's you know be realistic and. It's yeah. aimed for the yeah. playoffs. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. But, but what will come more into focus come January is the run that the Brayhead clan could have. And will this Gardner Earhart situation allow them to have a run at the league title that they, that let's be fair, choked on last year? They should have yeah. lifted that title last yeah. year and they choked on it. Now, does the does the does the conference situation and the drive of the Brayhead clan mean that once these five games, these five cro- cross conference games, does that make them superfluous? Are they going to basically run roughshod over the Gardner Conference and take the title? Well, well, I, I think people are going to be talking more about this come come mid to late January. Yeah, for sure. And as you say, the the kind of quirk of the fixtures there is going to be interesting, especially if Edinburgh can keep up their level of play because they're seventh right now <clears throat> yeah. uh, and if they can, can keep this level up they they could you know either be a spoiler or maybe a dark horse come the playoff time because once they're in they're in and as Coventry showed last year anything can happen yeah, well, I'd love to see the Edinburgh Capitals mm. in the final four. I yeah. think that it was such a the fact that the, the, when Fife made it, Hull made it, Brayhead made it when they were just coming mm. through. It was such a vindication for the system or the new look to the system that and it showed that these teams were getting better. Um, yes, unfortunately, Hull have fallen by the wayside, and a lot of people have pointed at the Gardner Conference and the fact that they had to travel so much. Mm. Let's be fair; the Packs couldn't do anything with Hull. Tomo and the and the Coventry conglomerate couldn't do with anything with Hull. You know. It, the fact that Bobby McEwen tried so hard is credit to him, but I think Hull were always on a hiding to nothing. They didn't have, they didn't have, a, um, they had great fans, but they didn't have a huge fan base. Mm. So the the actual financial situation in Hull was always going to play out this way, in my opinion, um, which meant that the, the the advent of the return of the storm, yep, was both a great thing for the elite league and but and lucky. I think it was also lucky. I think the 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 wranglings between the Manchester Phoenix and and Planet Ice and and that group Silverblades has allowed for the Manchester Storm to come in, and a hell of a lot of politics that I'm not going to get into in that. But <laughs> as I, so as sorry as I do feel for the whole Stingrays fans because I've been there. I, I was living in Newcastle when the Newcastle Vipers ceased to be. I, I, you know, I was. I still have many good friends who don't have. Uh, a top level or our an ice hockey team to follow and and I saw some of them last weekend because they still love their hockey and they were over watching the Frozen Four sorry the Frozen Four no, I'm not going that far the Friendship Four <laughs> the friendship they, they, they were there over watching the Friendship Four and you know it's it's horrible when you lose your team like that now yeah you know, the Pirates have arrived with their awful color scheme and oh jeez yeah and, wow and, and <laughs> fair play that's you know, that's that's brought EPL hockey to them and and, and more power to them now. We'll see as this whole thing plays out if the likes of Dundee, the likes of Edinburgh, the likes of Fife, and maybe even Manchester cause an upset. But for one of those four teams, maybe even two, but for at least one of those four teams, if they could reach the final four in Nottingham come April, well, that would be absolutely superb. Yeah, I agree, I agree entirely. So, unfortunately, I think we've run out of time for about this week. Uh, where can people find you online and so forth, Paddy? Well, as always, we're uh, kingdomofthegiants.com forward slash podcast is our a View from the Bridge or at AVFTB on Twitter, mate. Perfect. And you're at Patrick Smith. With I am y, indeed. Or, with a Y. Podcast. With a Y. Or calling Patrick Smythe, as my iPhone says whenever I use Siri. Oh, yes, you, Siri. And uh, also the, the, the best piece of technology, which is completely useless to me when I actually need it. <laughs> and they're, 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 calling me that, they're calling me that now on purpose on this podcast, <laughs> the Manchester Storm podcast. Right. Thank you again for joining me today, Paddy. Ma- Take care always a pleasure. Keep up the great work. Really love the show. Thank you very much. Cheers, Paddy. One. Not short. And there we go. That about wraps it up for this week's podcast. Thanks again to Paddy Smith for joining me. Uh, as he said, said, you can find the A View From The Bridge team on kingdomofthegiants.com and on Twitter at AVFTB. Well worth a listen for any Elite League fans or just general hockey fans looking for something a little bit different out there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at robmcgregor35. You can find the blog, onepuckshort.wordpress.com. And you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash onepuckshort. You can also email us, onepuckshort at gmail.com. Any questions, comments, feedback, whatever you want to get off your chest, please get in touch. Uh, listening feedback is always very important to me. 
You can also, if you're so inclined, donate to help support the podcast and the website with hosting costs, things like that. It's not cheap to run. I uh, love to do it, but obviously it all comes up in my own pocket. There is a donate button for PayPal on the One Put Short blog. Again, oneputshort.wordpress.com. Uh, there is also an Amazon affiliate link. So in your lead up to Christmas, if you just click that link, it takes you to the Amazon homepage. You do your shopping as per normal. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but we get a little kickback from whatever you buy. Maybe a few pence, maybe a few pounds, but it all adds up. And again, it all helps go towards hosting costs and domain renewal and such and such. Thanks again for listening this week. I'll speak to you all again very soon.